Good morning. Welcome to St. James. I'm glad that you guys are here. Could I start by saying thank you to all the people? We had a bunch of stuff going on this weekend, and I want to say thank you to all the people who worked so hard on um, uh, staffing the Cover Bridge uh, 5K yesterday, and uh, especially to Jen for all the work that she did. She worked real hard on that. Also, for all of you who were out here with the uh, youth group yard sale, that was a big thing too. There was, I, I think that there, there were people here before five o'clock in the morning, and then it was all day and very hard manual labor too. And especially to Ruth, who uh, spearheaded that and did a, a ton of work for that. So thank you uh, for helping out with those things. It's a, it's a really cool thing to serve the community, and um, we'll have more and more of those opportunities as time goes on. Uh, everything's on schedule for today. New members class at 6.30. Please, if you're not going to be there, let me know. Um, but we are planning on meeting tonight at 6.30. Uh, w- one thing I want to run by you, and then uh, we can get into worship. Uh, Jen's got a, a, an announcement to make, is next Sunday we're going to take up a door offering for, that, uh, for the Metro East Lutheran High School matching grant. Um, Dr. Krause was here. You can read about it in the bulletin. We're going to do a door offering next Sunday, and then we're going to do a door offering a couple, two or three weeks, a couple weeks after that. This is not a request for you to give twice to this. And in fact, I should say this, for those of you who are visiting, like you're not expected to give anything at all. Like when the offering plate goes by, please, that's, uh, don't feel burdened uh, to contribute to that. It's a family thing, and uh, we're serving the Lord with our tithes and offerings. Uh, the reason why we're going to have two of these is because in the summertime, our attendance is always way down because people are traveling in and out, and that gives an opportunity for people to give. I mean, you don't have to be here to give. You could uh, put a check in the offering at any time and just put um, Metro East Lutheran High School matching grant in the, in the memo, if you would. But next week will be the first of those, and we'll have that at the end of the service, so um, on your way out, uh, a free will door offering. Okay, I think that that's all I have in terms of notices. If Jen wants to come and give her announcement, and then when she's done, we will uh, stand and sing the opening hymn. Good morning. So Pastor Miller just said we'd have some more opportunities to service the community. Not even five minutes later, I have two. So uh, we are going to serve lunch to all the workers of uh, Glen Carbon. So police officers, firemen, Everybody that works at Village Hall, library, there'll be about 80 people, I guess, they say. So uh, Friday, June 30th, and Wednesday, July 19th, we're going to serve lunch here. And there's many ways that you can help. The first day, we're doing hot dogs, no, no, not hot dogs, brats and hamburgers, and then we'll have some sides. So I'm looking for someone to grill that day. Anybody wants to come talk to me afterwards? And then I have some homemade desserts. So I have a sign up for about eight desserts. And if you'd like to come help serve the food that day and a few people to be greeters, that would be wonderful. So either one of those days. So if you would like to, I'll be around afterwards and I'll be downstairs at Sunday school and I'll leave it out. And it'll be great fun. Thank you. Thank you. 
continue in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's confess our sin to God our Father. O oh Lord, merciful Father, you keep covenant and steadfast love with those who love you and keep your commandments. We confess that we have not listened to your servants, the prophets. We have not heeded your law, nor have we rejoiced in your gospel. We confess that things have fallen apart. But Lord, you keep covenant even when we do not. Your love is steadfast when ours is frail and fallible. You are faithful even when we are faithless. We want you to be our God, and we want to be your covenant people. Grant us the gift of faith. By your Holy Spirit, work in us steadfastness and singleness of heart, that we might manifest your love in the keeping of your commandments and the living of your gospel. O oh Lord, merciful Father, hear our prayers in the name of your well-beloved Son, Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new and eternal covenant, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Because of Jesus, God has forgiven all our sin. Hear the gospel of Christ from 1 John. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven on account of Jesus' name. Amen. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Psalm 51 is the psalm for this morning. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, 
so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You may be seated. Old Testament reading is uh, Genesis 3, 1 through 19. This is the story of the fall. We read the story of creation last week, and we're moving through the key signpost in the story of the Bible over the next couple months, and this, of course, is the next big one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, 
where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. To Adam he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Epistle reading from Romans 5. Paul says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and not while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we've now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
We stand for the gospel reading. Holy gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 15. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? If they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you've made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines, the commandments of men. And he called the people to him and said to them, hear and understand, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. And the disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone, they're blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May be seated. All right, look at Psalm 51. That's the psalm for today. Um, we're going to work our way through the story of the Bible and um, look at the, again, we're going to look at the key signposts that point us uh, from, the very, from, from the very beginning all the way to the very end, from Genesis to Revelation. I'm going to encourage you. In fact, I'm going to insist that if um, you don't, on your own during the week, explore the terrain off the highway, then you're really kind of missing the point. When someone gives you a map and tells you, here's how to get to someplace cool, the point isn't to look at the map. The point is to get out on the road and start exploring. And so what, what I want to do this morning is to give us a map, and, and hopefully it's more than just a map, but the main point here is to get into God's Word on your own and start, start doing some ATV stuff. Start going off and exploring, keeping in mind where you are where, where you are along the path. It's really kind of the only, you don't want to get lost. And sometimes we read the Bible, and we don't know where we're at. People say to me, like, I was reading Nehemiah, and like, what in the heck's going on? Well, if, you, if you've got the map, you can k- kind of suss out where you are, and then it's safe to explore. But please, uh, two commercials here, please be reading the text on your own. Not just the text that we're looking at, but the text in between too. So this, it's a real short jump from Genesis 2 to Genesis 3, I know. The next time we get together, there'll be a bigger jump. 
during the week, read in between there and kind of see what the terrain looks like. That's my first commercial. The second commercial is this. I am telling a story. I'm trying to tell the story of the Bible, which means um, I'm not saying it's, it's not God's sacred law that you need to listen to every sermon that I preach. I wouldn't do that if I were you. But it is a story. It's, these aren't designed to be little distinct one-off sermons. You, you wouldn't, if, if, if you recommend, you know, a favorite Netflix series to a friend, and, you know, it's, it's, it's eight, eight seasons long, and they come back to you and they said, I don't get it. I didn't like it. I didn't get it. You said, well, what, what, did you, which one did you start with? And they said, well, I started, there was this, I picked out one at random. I picked out episode, you know, uh, episode three in season four. You'd be like, you're doing it wrong. Like, that's not how this works. It's a story. You got to get into the arc. So if you miss a week, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it um, on the church's YouTube channel because I am trying to tell a story from beginning to end. So last week was chapter one, which is creation. God creates this unbelievably beautiful world because he loves us and he wants a relationship with us. This is why he creates the world. Bad news is this week we're going to talk about the fall or the curse. So we're going to look at Psalm 51 to do this. Um, we're going to do this, uh, do this every week this summer that we're doing this series is we're going to look at the story, but we're also going to look at it through the filter of a psalm that gets us into that story. And by doing that, I hope that we're not just looking at the story that's important enough, but we're doing it as an act of worship, as an act of prayer before the face of our Father. So Psalm 51, look at it in your bulletin or in your Bible. I did remember to include, um, I forgot last week to include the verse numbers. That'll make it easier for us to keep track of where we're at. Um, I'm going to talk about four things this morning. Um, uh, the cause of our fall, the extent of our fall, the result of our fall, and then the cure for our fall. So what I mean by the fall is this. Adam and Eve, like we just read in Genesis 3, God creates a perfect world. Adam and Eve rebel against him and introduce all kinds of nasty stuff into it. That's what the fall is. Let's talk about that a little bit this morning. So first of all, the cause of our fall what is the cause? And it's not just Adam and Eve's fall. It's the fall that we've all inherited, the, the fall that we, I was talking to somebody the other day. I don't know of anybody, and we, we, we were saying this, who do you know? Do, do you, the, the most religious person you know in the world and the most secular person you know in the world, if you talk to both of these people, they will all say, the world's a screwed up place. There's a lot of bad stuff going on. Everybody agrees that there's something wrong that there's something broken about what's going on. What's the cause of this? David pinpoints this in verse four. He says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. I have sinned against you, God. I have acted against you. It's possible to read the Genesis three story and to think, geez, talk about overkill. Like you tell the people not to eat this piece of fruit and they eat the piece of fruit and then death. Destruction, broken relationships, yikes. What, what, God seems to be like, that, that, that seems to be overkill. He seems to be kind of a, a meanie there. He's got this cosmic power. He can shoot lightning bolts out of his fingertips. And so they, they ate his favorite fruit or whatever. And so he blows them up for that. It seems kind of petty on God's part. It's probably the wrong way. To, the, the, the point isn't the badness of the sins that we commit. The point is who we're sinning against. That's the point. There's a guy named William Joyce who, um, he was hanged in 1947. He's a British citizen. And um, at the beginning of World War II, he's a British citizen. He left and moved to Germany. He was a fascist. He left and moved to Germany and joined the Nazi party. And because he had some experience in broadcasting, and of course he was a native English speaker, he was hired to do propaganda broadcasts by the Nazis, which he did. He was known, this is, look up his Wikipedia page. I don't want to go into all of it. He was, nor, he was known by uh, the Brits and by the Canadians and the Americans who listened to his broadcast as Lord Ha Ha. Maybe some of you have heard of him before. He was captured after the war, and he was hanged. Now, that's interesting. Albert Speer, who was in Hitler's inner circle and a card-carrying member of the Nazi party, was not hanged. He was sent to prison. Why was this British guy, who all he did was broadcast on the radio saying, 
Germany's going to win. You should encourage your governments to surrender. Why was he hanged? And the answer is, it's because he had committed high treason against the king of England. It, it wasn't the badness of what he had done. It was that he was intentionally undermining his own government's authority. He was t- intentionally trying to stir up rebellion against his very own government. High treason is always worthy of death. It always has been. And what Adam and Eve have done and what you and I have done, what David has done, is high treason against the king of the universe. N- nobody is saying, you know, so, so uh, you, know, you kind of snap at your wife because she's, she says something passive aggressive to you. N- nobody is saying that that's the worst thing in the world. Nobody's saying like, wow, you're really plumbing the heart of darkness there, buddy. Nobody's saying that. that the, the problem isn't the badness of what we do. It's who we're doing the bad things toward. And, da- and David says, I- I've sinned against God, and so I'm, I'm worthy of death because of who I've sinned against. Now, I, I know that he's um, sinned against uh, Uriah and Bathsheba and his own family, and some people have said, this is kind of weird. Like, David killed one of his best friends, Uriah, and slept with his wife and knocked her up. And so how can he even pray and say, against you only, God, I've sinned? Well, did, you just killed somebody. How can you pray that? Well, well, David knows it's wrong to murder people and sleep with their wives. David knows that. But David also knows that the main point is not the damage he's done, as bad as that is, the main point is the damage as against whom he has directed that damage. There's a great quote by Derek Kidner, who's a really fantastic uh, commentator on the Psalms, and he says about this verse, sin can be against oneself and against one's neighbor, but the flouting of God is the length and breadth of it always. Sin can be against oneself and against one's neighbor, but the flouting of God is the length and breadth of it always back of every sin and at the heart of every sin and the true evil behind every sin is not the damage we do to ourselves and to each other, but the flouting of God, of saying, like Adam and Eve in the garden, we want to be God. We want to be like God. It's, It's the attempted overthrow of God this is what our sin is. It's the attempted overthrow of God. And, and, and none of you good Christians think like that, of course, but it's true. That's actually what's going on in our heads when we think, I, you know, I, I know God says this, but I'm going to do this. What we're saying is, is well, God gets to say, I, I don't, he's a great advisor. You know, I have my devotions. He, I, I go to him for wisdom sometimes. But really, when it comes down to it, I'm in charge. I do what I want. This is the primal sin behind Adam. And even if it's something as small as, Nobody can tell me how I should talk to my wife. Even if it's something as small as that, it's still an attempt to overthrow the sovereign God, and and, and thus it's worthy of death. Okay, that's the cause of our fall. It's our own sin. The extent of our fall, which you talked about verse 4, right? It's the sin against God. Um, I have some things here to say, but let's skip it, because we'll probably come back to it over the summer. We call this actual sin. Me smarting off to Angela. Me thinking bad thoughts about people who interrupt me when I'm busy, me stealing, me being tempted to violence. These are all actual sins of thought, word, and deed. But David also knows that that's not, it's not just what we do, it's not just what we think, it's not just what we say. There's also something fundamentally flawed about who we are. And that's called uh, original sin. David doesn't call it that, but we can call it original sin. Um, uh, Paul talks about that in the Romans 5 reading, right? That Adam sins and we all sin with him. When Adam sinned, we all fell with him, right? This is, a, we call this original sin. Super unpopular. I'm uh, talking to a guy right now about Christianity and he doesn't believe in original sin. He doesn't want to hear anything about original sin. It's not true. He doesn't believe in original sin. Um, because it's, it's it, you know, it's bad news. And it says about all of us, there's something wrong. There's something wrong about each one of us. And we look around and we think, well, that's, that, that's kind of nasty, thinking that people are bad. Like, can you really walk around life thinking that people are bad? That's not very comfortable. And yet, without it, without original sin, without the doctrine of original sin, we have a problem explaining why things are so screwed up. We have a problem explaining why things have gone so wrong in our world. 
you, you could say, I mean, one thing you could say is this. You could say, everybody is born perfect, like kind of clean slate. Babies are so innocent. There's nothing wrong with them. They don't do anything wrong. And then later on, they learn how to do bad things from our bad example, right? You could say that. David disagrees, though. David says in verse 5, you can see he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He doesn't mean, he doesn't mean that when his father and mother conceived him that that was sinful, that the act was sinful. He means that as soon as I was conceived, as soon as I was a human being, I was sinful. I was counted as sinful before God. There's something about me, even before I had a chance to even, even think a thought or do a deed or say a word, I was sinful in God's eyes. We call this original sin. It's very, it's very sort of self-righteous to say there's no such thing as original sin. I know there are bad people, but they've just kind of made bad choices. People are really sort of good. What's behind that is the desire for me to think that I'm really good. And I can look out. There's, there's two or three of you in here who have probably done some worse things than me. Maybe not. But there's two or three of you in here. And I can say, well, those are the bad guys. And it keeps me from having to say, actually, I'm the bad guy too. But that, like I said, that's, that's so myopic. If, you act, just, just look, if we just look in the mirror, you will see, and think more deeply about your own motivations. You will see that there's something broken about all of us. So I got a quote here from the great philosopher Bob Gibson, a cardinal pitcher in the 1960s. And if, for those of you who know about the, the cardinals in the 1960s, they were like right on the cutting edge of, of the civil rights movement. It was a team where way more than any other baseball team in the 1960s, it was made up of college-educated, intelligent black men. Um, all the white guys on the team were kind of Southerners and farm boys. All the black guys on the team, including Gibson and Kurt Flood and Bill White and um, Lou Brock, had all, all had college degrees. And they were all very deeply thoughtful. And Gibson was involved in the civil rights movement. He said this, but he, he, he also... He also knew himself. And at one point he says this, I think this is in his biography, he says this line, in a world filled with hate, prejudice, and protest, I find that I too am filled with hate, prejudice, and protest. The temptation is for me to think that I'm on the side of the right and that I'm doing the Lord's work and that the hate and the prejudice and the protest is out there headed towards me. But if I'm honest about this, Bob Gibson says, I too am filled with hate, prejudice, and protest. There's a famous quote by somebody who's maybe more of a philosopher, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And again, Solzhenitsyn was, uh, he was, he was a dissident in the Soviet Union. He was thrown into a gulag, spent years there. And um, he, he too, reflecting like Gibson on this temptation to think of like, we're the good guys. We dissidents who are for freedom and democracy, we're the good guys. The Communist Party and the KJB, they're the bad guys. But Solzhenitsyn also too smart to have that sort of myopic thinking like it's us versus them. We're the good guys and they're the bad guys. Says this. Solzhenitsyn, by the way, a Christian believer. He said, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them, to figure out who the baddies are, to sequester them and get rid of them. If only we could do that. But, he says, the line dividing good and evil which is that line we all want to know. We want to know who's the, like, and we divide up in all different sorts of ways, but we want to know who's on our side, who are the good guys, and who's on their side, who are the bad guys. Solzhenitsyn says that line that runs between good and evil, that separates, on the surface, that separates the us, the righteous, from them, the unrighteous. If you look closely enough, he says, but the dividing line, the line dividing good and evil, cuts through the heart of every human being. If you try to figure out where that line is between you and them, between the good guys and the bad guys, and you look at that line closely enough, and you're honest enough, and you think like David biblically enough, you will see that that line actually is running right through the middle of us. There are no innocents here. There are, this is not a case of us versus them. This is a case of us versus him. That's the problem of original sin. That's the problem of the fall. And when we get into the mindset that we are the right ones and they're the wrong ones, we have created a scenario where original sin does not affect us. It only affects them. We might not say that because we might, you know, you still remember your confirmation class. We might not say that, but that's actually what we're, that, that, that's the trap that we've fallen into. 
Solzhenitsyn goes on to say this. Who is willing to, I'll, I'll read this last line again, but the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? Who is willing to look at even, even the, the guards at his Soviet gulag? Who is willing to look at them and say, I wish that they were gone. I wish that they weren't here. I wish they were dead. To, to, to think that is to wish death upon yourself because you are no more innocent than they are. This is what David means by original sin. This is what God means by original sin. Original sin, it, it only makes, it actually makes sense of the world. I was thinking about this and then I listened to an interview kind of un, unrelated to this with a, a woman named um, Catherine Burblesing and she runs a school called the Michaela School. It's a charter school in downtown London. And she is not a Christian. She said in this interview, the interview was done by Christians, and she said, um, I'm not a Christian. And they said, you're, you, they brought up her biography. Her mother was a, a, is a devout Christian. She said, why aren't you a Christian? And she said, well, um, I don't believe in God. That was like, they, like, trying to think of a deep reason. I don't believe in God, she said. But she has this incredibly successful school that she's the headmistress of. She founded it, and she's the headmistress of the Michaela School. And she's gotten tons of flack from the media in London because she has come out very outspoken and said, all of my students are naughty. That's the word she uses. All of my students are naughty. They're all naughty. And, and she actually uses the word original sin in this interview. And she said that she has a Catholic friend who says to her, you guys get the original, you, uh, Catherine, in your school, you get the original sin part right, but you don't have grace, which that's another topic. We'll come to that at the end of the sermon. But she's like, yeah, I do. I believe in original sin. And the only way that I've been successful is because I'm convinced that the students need control. They need direction. They need instructions. They need to be punished when they do what's wrong. She's not even a believer, and yet she's wise enough to see that there's something wrong with us that needs fixing. We don't need to be coddled. We don't need to, just be, we don't need to look down deep inside of ourselves and learn who we truly are so we can follow our heart better. We actually, there's something broken about that. There's something deeply dark and depraved about that. And the result is this. Here's point number three. Adam and Eve are removed from God's presence. There's a lot of things that go bad in the Garden of Eden. A big one is death, right? Death gets written into the story. We all die. Um, corruption. Power plays between Adam and Eve and then between every human being who lives after that. The world not working right doing your job and it not paying out. You know, Adam's a farmer, he goes out and he puts in a ton of work and it doesn't pay out according to the amount of work that he put in. There's thorns and thistles. There's a lot of bad things. But the main number one thing is, is they're kicked out of God's presence. They're kicked out of God's presence. David knows that this is the thing to be most afraid of, which is why he says in verse 11, he prays, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. I, I, don't, don't get rid of me. Don't get me out of your presence, and don't you leave my presence. That's the big, the, let, me, let, me, let me link into the story here real quick. Adam and Eve, Genesis 1 and 2, God creates this beautiful world. Why does God create the beautiful world? This is uh, the point I was making, this is my main point from last week, is because God's deepest desire is to live with us. God's deepest desire is to dwell in our midst. God's deepest desire was to create this global temple where he would live with his image bearers. And they would be worshiping him, and they would be loving and serving each other, and they would be doing, we would be doing jobs, taking care of this beautiful environment that he gave us. Adam and Eve come along and screw it up. And because of that, God can't be in our presence anymore. Because of sin, God can't be in our presence anymore. Again, let me repeat, God is not a meanie. It is not the case that God is like, fine, you don't want to obey me, I'm out of here. The problem is, is that our nature is now completely different. Our nature is now sinful, and his nature is holy. And those two things can't be in the same, can't be in the same space. I, I know I've said this before, but it's like fire and paper, right? Paper can't go into fire because fire's nature is to burn paper. It's not the case that the fire hates the paper. It's not that, nothing to do with emotions. It's not that God, God doesn't hate us. God loves us. God wishes to rescue us. He's come up with a fantastic plan to rescue us. But the nature of our willful rebellion against him and the nature of his desire for his own glory cannot come together at all without us being destroyed. And so God, for our own safety, 
kicks us out of his presence. God wants to live with us, his people, but our rebellion makes that impossible. Okay, that's the first three points. How's everybody doing? It's very cheery, isn't it? Is everybody encouraged? Uh, It would be wrong for me to end there, although if I was just flat out telling the story, if I knew, if I could do like a sermon, one sermon that was a collection of like the next 20 sermons on the story of the Bible, I would just stop there and say, let's come back next week and see how God fixes this. And the answer would be, he calls Abraham. That's, that, that, that's a little uh, a pointer towards next week. But I can't do that because some of you, this might be, some of you are visiting, some of people are watching on live stream and they might not be back. And so this, in some sense, is going to be, for some of you, a one-off sermon And so I can't stop there. I have to talk about the cure for our fall. We've talked about the cause for our fall. We've talked about the extent of it. We've talked about the result of it. Now let's talk about the cure for our fall. David says in verses 9 and 10, he says, um, uh, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. David knows that there's two things that need to happen here. Verse 9, he needs his sins forgotten. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. God, I need you to pretend like I'm completely innocent. No, he's not. He k- killed one of his best friends and slept with his wife. He's not innocent at all, but he needs God to get rid of that. God, I need you to figure out a way to make like that never happened. To make like I'm perfect and innocent because I want to be in your presence. That's the first thing. The second thing he needs is in verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit. I mean, do you see? It's the original sin. It's not just like, God, forgive me. It's also like, my heart is screwed up. God, I need transforming. There's something broken and wrong about me. There's something broken and wrong about me. I, I, I know there are things I shouldn't do, and yet I keep going back and doing them, knowing that when I'm done doing them, I'm going to be miserable because I've, ha- because I've done them, and yet I cannot resist doing them. God, give me a new heart. I need clean from the inside and out. I need you to renew a right spirit within me. But how does he do this? How does God do this? All right, let's look at the last four verses in here. We're gonna look at 16 through 19, and then we'll be done, okay? David says, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good design in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Okay, so hang with me here. I'm gonna to try to make, if you don't understand what I'm about to say next, I assure you it is my fault that I have botched this. Um, if you don't understand anything, please uh, hang around and ask me questions afterwards. I'm gonna to try to make sense of this. David is explaining the solution. At the end of the Psalm, David explains the solution to his sin problem. Not just the sin that he's committed, but the place where it's coming from. By the way, do you see what David, David is saying the same thing that Jesus was saying in the gospel reading, right? It's, nobody makes you sin. You're not influenced to sin from the outside. Our sins come from our own hearts, right? So that means the key is not to get rid of the thems. The key is not to get rid of the bad influences, although it might be wise to do that. Like if you have a problem with gluttony, it might be wise, you know, to put more good things in the refrigerator and less bad things. But fundamentally, gluttony doesn't come from the stuff in the fridge. Gluttony does not come from the advertisements for fast food restaurants on TV, Gluttony comes from our own heart, which desires to fill our bodies up with something that will replace God. I I speak as somebody who struggles with gluttony. David says this, verse 19, uh, uh, verse 16, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. God, I know that you set up the sacrificial system, David says, but I I also know that ain't going to help this. I just killed one of my best friends. I can go and give sacrifices, but I know that's not going to work. That's not going to take away this guilt. It's not going to take away the real guilt. It's not going to take away the guilt feelings. Sacrifice, look, some of you punish yourself for the things that you've done wrong, or you have a habit of punishing yourself for stuff that you do wrong. That's not going to work. It's just not going to work. You, you, you screw something up at work. This is what some of us do. You screw something up at work, and you just think, okay, 
Maybe you don't even think it. You just, it's like kind of your default mode. I'll take the blame for other stuff that's going on here that might not be my fault as a way to sort of atone for it, as a way to like make up for the fact that I screwed up. Some of you have trained yourself to tell yourself bad things about yourself over and over as a way to punish yourself for sins that you've committed in the past, damage you've done to your relationships in the past. You've trained yourself to do that. It's not just that that's unhealthy. It's that it's not realistic. There's no sacrifice that you could pay to make up for what you've done. There's no sacrifice that you could, David knows, I can't do sacrifice. There's nothing that you can do to actually atone for what you've done in the past. You can beat yourself up all you want, but at the end of the day, that thing that happened, that thought you thought, that word you said to somebody that was extremely damaging, which you cannot take back, can't be taken back. It's there. Sacrifices don't work. They don't work. Now, the the good news is, is that Sacrifices do work, you know that, because it says in the very last line, the very last verse, then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Okay, what the, what's going on with this? Because he says in verse 16, you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. But then at the end he says, you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. What has happened in between? What has happened to move David from saying, God, you, don't, you, will, not like, you will not look at these sacrifices to, God, you will delight in these sacrifices. What happens in between? In the text. So you don't have to answer. Sorry, I, I paused like I expected the answer. Verse 19. Okay, so this is what's in the text. Look at verse 19. Do good design in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. And then you'll like the sacrifices. Okay, so here's what David says. I can't sacrifice to make up for me killing Uriah and sleeping with his wife. I cannot do any sacrifices. But God, I need you to build up the walls of Jerusalem and to be good design in your good pleasure. And then I will be forgiven. What does he mean, build up the walls of Jerusalem and do good design and do good to Jerusalem in your pleasure? How does that pay for the sins? Pay for his sins. Well, you have to kind of know, um, you have to kind of know the story. You have to kind of know the story. Jerusalem is gonna fall. David's gonna fight for Jerusalem. He's gonna own it. But eventually it's gonna fall and the temple and the walls are gonna be destroyed. And you know why? The prophets all tell us this. This is later on in the story. We'll get to it later. Like I said, I've gotta shoot ahead in the story if I'm gonna end this as a Christian sermon. Jerusalem is gonna fall because God abandons it. God comes to live in the tabernacle, but then he leaves because God's people rebel and he goes away. And what David is saying here is, God, you need to move back here. You need to come back home. We need you back in Jerusalem. Until you come here and you reestablish this city, until you yourself come here and put yourself into the temple, we're all doomed. But when you do, David knows, when you do come into this temple, when you do move in here, when you do establish your people, we will be rescued. Here's what David is saying. I can't pay for this. I don't own enough cattle to pay for the sin of killing one of my best friends. But God, you can do it. If you come down here and you move into the temple, if you yourself become the good sacrifice, if you come down here and rescue us, then I can be at peace with you. He is begging God to come and pay for his sins himself. And this is what God does. Look, you can't cut yourself enough to pay for the lousy person that you think you are. But somebody has cut themselves enough to pay for the lousy person that he knows you are and is determined to transform you into the beautiful person that he sees you as. You cannot beat yourself up enough to pay for your sins, but one was beaten up enough to pay for your sins. Your own death, people talk about this, people who commit or attempt attempt suicide talk about this, people who leave suicide notes talk about this, this is the only way to make things right. Your own death cannot pay for your sins, but someone died who can pay for your sins. Someone came and set up shop in Zion, built up the walls of Jerusalem and said, I am king and priest and sacrifice here and I will pay for your sins. And because he did that, everything gets changed. The brokenness of the world around you, and this Christianity is the only religion that makes sense of both of these things. The horrible brokenness of the world around us and the deep beauty down behind everything that God sees, created, and is bound to dig out and repair. Both of these things are true. Let me close with this. This is one of the craziest verses in the whole Bible. But David is tapping into this. 
Like I did, my sin is horrible, but God, you are amazing to forgive it. I'm gonna close with this last verse. This is, this is really, again, one of the craziest verses in the Bible. Look at verse 14. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing a lot of your righteousness. This is one of the most amazing verses in the whole Bible. If this verse can be in the Bible, you can be saved. Do you see what he's saying? Now, it sounds like, okay, religious language, deliver me, I'll praise you with my mouth. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation. What does that mean? God, forgive me for murdering my best friend. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. And then my tongue will sing a lot of your righteousness. God, if you forgive me for murdering my best friend, I will go to church and I will sing praises to you so loud. That's crazy. How can David pray that? Because David knows that the God who sacrifices himself for us takes, gets rid of sin, gets rid of the evil things that even we do to each other and to ourselves. That the, that the, that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is strong enough to forgive us when our sacrifices aren't. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for forgiving our sins. Father, you know that, 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 that we're still broken and sinful. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sins. Don't cast us from your presence, Lord. Don't take your Holy Spirit from us. Create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit, some, a spirit among us for your own sake, for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name that we pray, amen. White as snow, white as snow, though my sins were as scarlet, Lord, I know, Lord, I know that I'm clean and forgiven through the power of your blood, through the Please stand for prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being such a good God and for loving us. And thank you for, um, in spite of our rebellion against you, calling us to the vocations you've called us to, for renewing in us your image, for making us look like your son, Jesus Christ, for restoring us to the roles that you had planned for us in the garden when we had rebelled against you and our parents. Father, help us to be faithful. Wash us uh, again. Wash us from our sins and renew uh, a right vocation in us so that we can serve you better. And we thank you for the ministries that you've called, uh, not just as individuals to, but our church to. We thank you for uh, the ministry clarity process that you've called us to and those who are helping lead that, especially for Eric and his ministry there. 
Lord, show us where you want us to go. Show us the ministries that you want us to have and the purpose that you want us to have and provide for us and protect us and grow our church in you, Father. Help us to grow closer to you uh, more and more all the time. Help our relationships to grow closer. Give us forgiveness. Uh, Father, we'll, we'll know that your Holy Spirit is work, at work when you start crafting the gift of forgiveness amongst us. Uh, Father, give us that gift for your name's sake. We also pray for our ministry at Unity Lutheran School and for the students that you've called there and the teachers that you've called there. And we pray as um, they look for a new 7th and 8th grade teacher that you would provide one for them uh, who can uh, st- step into the shoes of Kevin, who's leaving to become a school principal over in St. Louis, and that you would uh, provide resources for them and uh, great teachers and great students and guide and protect that school. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father, we thank you for our sister churches in the area, and we thank you especially this morning for St. Paul Wood River and for Pastor David Schultz there, and that you would bless him in the ministry and that you would bless all the people there as they seek your face this morning and hear your word proclaimed and celebrate your sacrament. We pray that you would bless and be with all of our uh, Bible-believing churches in the area, and that together all of us could see your kingdom growing, uh, surely here in Glen Carbon, and we'll give you the praise and glory for that, Lord, in your mercy. And Father, we pray for all those who are struggling with worries and with sicknesses and with uh, griefs and, um, again, relationship brokenness. Oh Lord, give us healing and hope in you. Help us to be new creation people looking to the promise of ultimate forgiveness and fulfillment to find our, uh, our, our purpose and our hope and our meaning. And I pray especially this morning that you would be with uh, Sarah Kate and with um, uh, Alice Eloise too as she's in the final weeks of her life. And Sarah Kate, of course, is uh, real tore up that you would uh, bless Sarah Kate and give her uh, hope through all of this and comfort in that uh, you would make uh, the remainder of their time together sweet and that you would allow us to be a support to them. I pray especially this morning that you would be with Marsha Cording um, and that we give her hope and comfort uh, in the face of the death of her husband Tyler this week and that you would provide for her, that you would lift her up, Lord, and that uh, the loneliness that she's feeling, may it be a cue to us to step in and fill that gap with your presence and community and that we would be with her and that we would walk with her and that she would experience the love of your son Jesus through our love. Lord, in your mercy. We pray all these uh, prayers, Lord, because you've invited us to, commanded us to, you've called us your children and you've told us right from the very beginning, right from Genesis 1, that what you want is relationship with us and Lord, you know that we're incapable of building that relationship, and deep down we're broken enough to not even want that relationship sometimes. Overcome that that, that rebellion, Lord, and bring us into your presence and give us a real heart for you. Give us a real thirst for your presence, a real taste for you. Help us to see that you're good. We know that you are. Father, keep on making that real to us. We We pray these prayers in the name of our brother Jesus. Amen. Let's confess our faith together with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, 
and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you've had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Grant us your spirit, gracious Father, that we may give heed to the testament of your Son in true faith. And above all, firmly take to heart the words with which Christ gives to us his body and blood for our forgiveness. By your grace, lead us to remember and give thanks for the boundless love which he manifested to us when by pouring out his precious blood, he saved us from your righteous wrath and from sin, death, and hell. Grant that we may receive the bread and wine, that is, his body and blood, as a gift, guarantee, and pledge of his salvation. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated.
And now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you and keep you in the one true faith to life everlasting. Depart in Christ's peace. Amen. Bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Uh, happy Father's Day. I think that the, uh, there's gifts for the fathers back there while supplies last. So hustle up. Go in peace.